den Richtlinien so vorgenommen worden sind, wie wir das für richtig halten. Das heißt... Identity Crisis by Thomas F. Monteleone Elliot Bender huddled in the corner of the dark supply room, caressing the business end of a linoleum knife. Outside in the main corridor, the sounds of the hospital blended together, the paging system loudspeakers, the creaking wheels of gurney carts, offhanded laughter of passing student nurses, the occasional footsteps, of someone passing close by the supply room door. Dressed in hastily stolen hospital garb, Bender appeared to be just another surgeon in the huge hospital. The pale green OR cap and matching pajama-like tunic and pants covered his street clothes. The surgeon's mask concealed his stoical features. The shift change, he thought. I'll wait until the change of shift. Lots of confusion, then. No one will notice me. The blade felt keen and sharp as he edged it with his thumb, following its menacing curve down to the point. In the darkness, it reminded him of the talon of some horrible creature, and he smiled. He checked his liquid crystal watch and smiled again. Not much longer now. Balding, thin, and yet working on a double chin, Elliot Bender did not normally appear very threatening. In fact, he was quite meek-looking and had always thought himself to be the perfect stereotype of a timid bank clerk. In fact, he was a timid hardware store clerk. Sitting in the dark, his mind drifted back over the chain of events that had brought him to his present state of mind and place in the cosmos. It was the hardware store, where he had worked for almost twenty years, twenty years. The store had been owned by Leo J. Benford Sr., a kindly old gentleman who understood the faithful service and loyalty of good employees. Elliot had worked for the old man from the beginning and gave the owner an honest day's work every day, year in and year out. Things went along pleasantly, and after ten years' service, Elliot was made the manager of Benford's hardware, earning a good salary and making the payments on his bungalow. Mr. Benford was very happy with his work, and had even loaned him the money for the down payment on the little house. Elliot Binder was a happy, contented man. That is, until the owner's son, Leo J. Benford Jr., started coming down to the store after school and on Saturdays to learn the business. Still a teenager, the young Leo Benford had already acquired a hard edge to his personality and an envious glow to his eyes. He looked like a vulture waiting to descend upon soon-to-be carrion, and even back then Elliot knew enough not to trust the owner's son. As time passed, Leo Jr. spent his summers home from college in the hardware store, and he became an increasing source of annoyance and irritation to all the employees, especially Elliot Binder. No matter how diplomatic or nice Binder attempted to be with Leo Jr., there was no getting around the young man's obnoxious nature and know-it-all attitude. Leo Jr. was contemptuous of Elliot's authority and took every opportunity to ignore his suggestions and disobey outright his requests in day-to-day -day business. But Elliot had been a patient man, and he hoped that perhaps Leo Jr. was just another young man feeling his oats, as they used to say and that time and maturity would change him into a more agreeable, reasonable person. Thus did Elliot avoid speaking with the father and owner of the store about the problems experienced with the son. Perhaps I should have said something. But he didn't say anything, and the situation became increasingly worse until, inevitably, Elliot and Leo Jr. hated each other. 
That was apparent to all the other employees, but unfortunately not to Mr. Benford Sr., who was spending more time in his greenhouse and less and less time in his business. In fact, the only thing that kept Elliot sane and whole had been the casual mention by Leo Sr. that he intended to open another hardware store in the next town and that he would be making Elliot a full partner, along with his son, of course. The papers, the old man told him, were being drawn up by his lawyers, and everything would be official as soon as his attorney came back from a trip to the Bahamas. Time passed quickly, it seemed. At that point, Dan Leo Jr. graduated from college, married, and was often seen with his pregnant wife carrying about the next generation of the Benford line. Elliot hoped that this coming responsibility, plus the inclusion of both into a business partnership that would finally thaw out the relationship between he and the impetuous Leo Jr. But it was even less than wishful thinking. On the same weekend that Elliot had told his wife of the elder Benford's plans, he received a phone call from Mrs. Leo J. Benford Sr. The woman was on the brink of hysteria as she struggled to tell him that her husband had been killed in an auto accident only an hour previous. Elliot had been shocked. It was as though his own father had died, and the sense of loss and sincerely felt grief was almost overwhelming. He could only think of never seeing the dear old man again, was therefore not thinking of what further consequences might follow that unfortunate and very untimely demise. Naturally, Elliot closed the store until after the funeral, and although he attempted to contact the son several times, he was unsuccessful. When he saw Leo Jr. at the funeral service, the young man ignored him completely. But on the day business reopened, the young man was more than eager to speak with him. Elliot was not surprised to see the young new owner seated behind his desk that fateful morning. To tell the truth, Elliot had even expected it, and the demotion that would surely accompany the gesture. But he was surprised by Leo Jr. in a way he could not have expected. "'Good morning, Binder. I've been waiting for you,' the son had said. "'Have you?' "'Yes, and I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. The young Leo was almost grinning, unable to contain the obvious joy surging through him at that moment. What kind of bad news, Elliot said. Oh, the worst, I can assure you. I'm afraid it's pink slip time for you, old man. I want you to get all your shit out of here immediately. It's over, and I never want to see your simple face around here again. What? Elliot had said, his voice carrying all the shock and disbelief and pain that such cruelty could summon. You're firing me? You're letting me go? Oh yes, absolutely, Leo Jr. had smiled at that point. Perhaps it was the smile, the certain enjoyment the son had displayed then, or perhaps it was the years of resentment and hate finally bubbling to the surface. Elliot would never know for sure, but he did know he would extract his revenge on the young bastard who sat grinning before him. He hated him at that moment, as he had never hated anything in his life, and it was the only the beginning of the ordeal. Every place where Elliot applied for work, having cited his managerial experience at Benford's Hardware, he was quickly denied employment. One prospective employer volunteered to Elliot that he had received a less-than-glowing reference from Leo Jr. It was apparent, then, that it was not enough for the young son to simply dismiss Elliot in disgrace. No, Leo Jr. clearly intended to ruin him. Elliot ended up working in a lumber mill, making half of his previous salary and sliding slowly under a wave of bills, loan notes, and other economic pressures. First, he had to pull his son from private school. Then he second mortgaged the house and had the car repossessed and the phone disconnected. His wife became disenchanted, then enraged at his inability to support her in her accustomed manner. The pressure continued to build until he thought he would go insane without some kind of release, some kind of catharsis. He was going to hell in the old handbasket, and he decided that maybe he would take someone with him. He would take his revenge. Leo Jr. would pay for his injustices. He would suffer as no man had ever suffered. And so Elliot Binder descended into the maelstrom that is the chaos of the broken spirit and the tortured mind, 
knowing that he would never return. The only piece that remained to be fitted into the jigsaw picture of madness was the act itself, which came to him in a moment of pure inspiration, when his wife told him that Mrs. Leo J. Benford, Jr. had given birth to a baby boy the day before. Acting with quiet deliberation, Elliot went into his basement and carefully selected the proper instrument, a linoleum knife, from Benford's hardware. Yes, he had thought with a smile, this is perfectly ironic. It will do nicely. He took a cab downtown to the hospital, took an elevator up to the maternity ward, walked the halls as though he might be an impatient, expectant father, and waited for the moment when he was unobserved. When it came, he slipped into the supply room and quickly searched through the shelves, stacks of linens and gowns until he found the proper disguise. Now the time has come. There were the sounds of increased activity outside the small dark room, and Elliot arose quickly, concealing the linoleum knife beneath his surgeon's gown. Opening the door, he slipped out into the corridor, unnoticed by the stream of white-uniformed nurses and orderlies. Yes, this was the perfect time. He walked down the hall, past the rooms of new mothers, to the glass-windowed nursery. His heart was pounding like a jackhammer in his chest, and his spit tasted like paper paste. But it was not from fear, rather from the feeling of approaching triumph. They can't catch me, he thought, and the certainty of that knowledge elated him with a rush of adrenaline. They can't! Striding purposefully, confidently, he pushed through the door to the nursery, where a charge nurse sat at a small desk reading a copy of People magazine. "'Just a minute, doctor,' she said. "'Can I help you?' He moved swiftly, striking her in the jaw with his fist. She went down immediately without a sound, and he rushed past her into the brightly illuminated warm room where the tiny clear plastic cribs were arranged in two neat rows. There were at least twenty newborn children, and Elliot knew that he must act quickly. Each baby had a little bracelet, and it would be a small matter to search out the one with the Benford name upon it, or so he thought. Frantically, as he held the tiny, pudgy little wrist of the nearest infant, he tried to make sense of the numbers and letters on the bracelet. Christ, it's some kind of code. No names! There was the sound of someone stirring beyond the door. Not much time. I've got to do something. He looked up to see his reflection in the glass window of the nursery, and beyond the glared images of several of the staff watching him with growing horror, he realized that he was holding the linoleum knife in plain view. Don't panic now. Think. Think! Taking one step back, he looked over the collection of cribs and knew what he must do. It's the only way to be sure, he thought, as he stooped over the first crib. And it won't take very long. Hey, Billy, why do you look so down? Aw, Dad, I got a computer, a PlayStation, and a barn full of iguanas, and I'm still bored. (sighs) Gee, Billy, when I was your age, I would read lots of stories in pulp magazines. Oh, with stories of weird adventure and fantasy, horror, satire, and lots of action. Wow, that sounds great, Dad. Yeah, I sure wish there was something like that right now. <laughs> there is Daddy-O. Who are you? I'm Dr. Mary Von Rocksprocket, host of the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour. And now there's... Twisted Pulp Magazine! (laughs) What's that, Doctor? Why, it is a return to greatness! Available on all your digital devices! That is what it is! Look! Whoa! Dad, this looks awesome! Exciting and, dare I say it, very unwholesome! You definitely have that right, my good man! (laughs) Ha ha! Thanks, Dr. Mary! My pleasure, Billy! And just between you and me, I am not sure that this man is really your father. Bye. Dad? Uh, 
Just read your Twisted Pulp magazine, Billy. Twisted Pulp magazine! Available in dark alleyways behind meth labs everywhere! Or at Amazon.com or ArchaicMedia.info That is A-R-C-H-A-I-C-M-E-D-I-A dot info! <laughs> End of the Road by Chauncey Haworth Narrated by Jerry Elif Daniel has really shaped up, Denise thought, her hands loosely holding the steering wheel as she lazily eyed the headlight-illuminated road and listened to her son Daniel talk about how his school is going. Daniel continued on about his new life. Yeah, I really like my roommates and my teachers seem cool, so far. Mostly, I just like being out of the house. Not that I want to be away from you and Dad, it's just nice to be in charge. It's amazing. Less than a year ago, Denise and her husband David were not sure Daniel would even be going to college. He had the grades, and thanks to the family's relatively low tax bracket, all the expenses were practically covered. It was hard for Denise to conceive that six months ago, they were picking him up at the police station, and now they were picking him up from college and Servi Deorum Catholic even. It was a much further drive to see him than Denise would prefer, and they ended up having to wait in line far too long, checking out of student housing, but to see her son happy and thriving made it all worth it. Now it was getting late, well past midnight, but Ipswich was right up the road and they would finally be home. At least they have time to catch up and I can get to know the new him better, she thought. Like his new interest in growing up, in programming, and apparently this new electronic music, synth rave or wave or something like that. Denise saw a faint yellow glow from the dash. Darn it. Looks like we're going to have to stop and get gas. Tell me if you see anything, Daniel. She was ready to be home. No worries. I could use a soda, he responded. Daniel had the usual carefree attitude of a 19-year-old body, topped with a 19-year-old late-night sleep schedule, but for Denise, it was late and she was done. Daniel had his arm out the window, his hand flat, whipping up and down in the rush of cool forest air. Up ahead, in the beams of the headlights, was a green reflection. As it got closer, the highway sign became legible. Bolton, five miles. Daniel spoke up. Bolton, five miles, Mom. Do you think they'll have gas, she hoped. Daniel got a snarky look on his face. As a man of the world now, I have learned one thing, Mom. If a town has a name, it has a gas station. She seemed to accept his newly found wisdom. Yeah, I I guess that's true. But will it be open? He didn't look at her. Just watched his hand level up and down on the waves of wind. Mom, even hicks have technology now. We'll be able to swipe the card and pump ourselves. Let's hope so, she said, putting on her blinker. He assured her they will. So... Have you met any nice girls at college, she asked? Or are nice girls even what you're interested in? Are you asking me if I'm gay, or are you asking me if I'm into kegger sluts, Daniel asked. Denise was a little taken aback by the casual use of the term kegger sluts from her son, but she tried to brush off the awkwardness and move on. I was thinking a little more down the lines of, Are you pursuing girls at this point or only interested in school and your future? But sure, I'll bite. Are you gay or into kegger sluts? He answered her, No, Mom, I'm not gay, and yes, I would like a nice girl. I've met a few, but nothing has gone anywhere. Just the usual. Again, 
Denise was confused as to if the usual meant flirty banter or drunken sex. Why is this so confusing, she thought. I was young once. It wasn't even that long ago. What is it about getting older? When I did those things as a kid, it was part of getting smarter and growing up. But now, when my kid may be doing them, I view it as the bane of society and how we have lost our way. I'm guessing from your quietness, Mom, that you're thinking about giving me the sex talk yet again. So no, I am not having sex with any of them. I wasn't thinking that, she lied. Whatever, Mom. I know you better than you know me. While I've been growing up and changing for 19 years, you've been the same consistent Mom. He still wasn't looking at her, just flippantly watching his hand in the wind, like a video game of some sort of challenge. While there was some truth to what he was saying, she still didn't like it. I've changed. Well, yeah, I guess so. You drink less wine and read more books at night, he said. See, she said with sarcastic pride, I have changed. Looks like there's a gas station coming up, Mom, Daniel said with a point through the windshield. Ahead, they saw the dim lights of a gas station first, followed by the lights of a small general store next to it. The store was pretty much dark, but the gas station pumps seemed well lit. She slowly pulled between the pumps, hoping they were open, or at least able to pump gas. She found relief when she saw the LED lights of the pay terminals. Oh, thank God. She stopped at one of the pumps, and the duo got out of the car. This is even more the middle of nowhere than Ipswich, Daniel stated, slamming the car door behind him. What a dump. Daniel, I'm sure it's a nice little town. She was trying to calm him down. She was always trying to calm him down. Even though Dave had told her it was normal young man behavior, she still found it aggressive. Denise knew that her placation had landed on deaf ears by his response of, There's a soda machine. Want anything? No, she answered. I'll pump the gas. Just hurry up. I want to get home and go to bed. I have to work in the morning and it's already very late. Yep, he responded. Daniel strutted over to the red glowing soda machine, sitting in front of the darkened gas station. He looked around as he went, his chest puffing out in awkward teenage confidence. He noticed the tall tree points silhouetted in front of the starry night. In a worldly effort, he tried to think of something profound about the view, but was quickly distracted back toward the vending machine's glowing promise of sugar. He stepped up the curb and to the machine. Coke, diet, Sprite. He prattled off to himself while he dug in his pockets for some bills. At the bottom of his left pocket, he found a wad of crumpled $1 bills. He straightened two of them out on the corner of the vending machine and slid them into the money slot. He took a pointless moment to make his choice, knowing that he would pick the same one he always does. He bumped his fist on the bright red button indicating Coke. There was a whizzing sound and a clunk, and then nothing. Fuck! He exhaled to himself, his chin falling to his chest. Then, as teen boys often do, he decided to fix it by giving it a solid smack or kick. He looked to his right to see if he could get away with the assault of the dispenser and saw literally nothing. Nothing but the dark road they came in on. He looked to the left and saw the dark market, but not entirely dark. There was a waving light in one of the windows. Is that a lighter? He questioned himself. In the dim window across the parking lot, he could see a small flickering flame waving back and forth, and behind it, 
several hands waving. Are they waving him away? Are they waving him closer? Fucking hick tweakers, he said to himself with contempt. He started walking back to the pumps, calling to his mother, much louder than necessary in the forest's vast silence. Mom, the stupid machine is busted, and there are some tweakers in the next building trying to get our attention. What? Denise said, looking up while still gripping the pump handle. In the window of the store, she saw the same thing, a lighter and several hands waving. They appeared to be waving frantically. Do they need help? she asked, puzzled. Who cares? Daniel rhetorically responded. We care, Daniel. That's who cares, she said with disappointment in her voice. Fine. I'll check it out, the teen said with a huff and immediately started making his way toward the store. She called to him. Daniel, wait! Daniel didn't stop. Why on earth would she have expected him to? He hadn't been one for listening up until now, and she couldn't see any reason why he'd start at 19. As the boy approached, he could tell that the people inside were yelling. As he got within yards of the window, he could make out a face. A face with red hair and light skin. A face that would have been kind of pretty if it hadn't been so completely consumed with terror. He could finally make out the words she was yelling. Run! Get the fuck out of here! Don't come here! Get in your car and call for help, you dumb shit! The boy looked on in shock. While being 19 makes one feel like they can take on the world, in reality, at 19, a few have taken on much, and Daniel was not the exception. He was frozen with confusion. Fuck! 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 Behind you! Behind you! The would-be pretty girl yelled at him. Daniel turned around to his mother. He saw her pumping gas, looking at him in bewilderment with one arm up and out like an irritated and confused teapot. The pumps, the car, and behind the car, he saw another girl. A naked girl with pale almost blue skin with a body that was bruised, a body that was plump while also emaciated, a corpse, a corpse with a hideous smile that conveyed nothing but hunger. Mom, he yelled, running toward her, look out. She looked to her left and right, then shrugged her shoulders, looking back at him with confusion. At that moment, she registered the fear on her son's face, a twisted look of terror that she had never seen before, but immediately deciphered that whatever was causing the bewildered look of terror was right behind her. She quickly turned with only enough time to register the rictus, the awful tooth filled smile and hear a metallic burning sound as the lights of the station went out with a sizzle. Denise threw up her free hand in defense as the corpse grabbed her, one twisted bony hand on her wrist, the other on the side of her neck. The bruised purple and blue corpse flexed. With a wet pop and a meaty tear, Denise's arm was ripped from the socket by the walking horror. The arm tossed aside, discarded as the smiling corpse moved in for the main course. The fang-filled maw bore down on her neck, slicing through the meat and bone like massive razor blades. Daniel watched as the creature ripped its head back pulling the meat with it, leaving an almost comical shark bite in his mother's body. No! He screamed as he stumbled back, falling to the ground on his hands and butt, knees up, unable to stop gawking at the horror before him in the starlight. The creature threw the mother's body to the side and leapt like a cat onto the hood of the car, licking its blood-stained hands. 
No, Daniel whimpered. The creature pounced upon the boy, dragging its jaw from his belly to his neck, ripping his insides open, exposing his guts. Daniel felt nothing. He just looked down at the creature laying over him as she almost lovingly stared at his gaping wound, staring at her next meal. This is Jackie Ayers, and you've been listening to Dead Airwaves on KKRN. Episode 5, Identity Crisis, by Thomas F. Monteleone. End of the Road, by Chauncey Haworth. Narrated by Jerry Elliff. Theme music, by Tim Slade.